my name is Katie Gray, and I am the head of the Archives and Cataloging Division for the Thomas C. Donnelly Library at New Mexico Highlands University. And today I'm going to be going over with you the basics of archiving and metadata and how those two things are connected. Now, normally when I start out talking about archiving and personal archiving projects and community archiving projects, um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of personal and family archiving and, and its part in the greater historical um, narrative. Uh, a lot of times people consider archives, when they think about archives, they think about institutional archives, like the kind where I work and the kind of collections that you find there in the historic record. And the problem with that is that institutional archives and the historic record in general often have a lot of gaps in them. Um, there are gaps in the record and voices that have been silenced traditionally. Um, sometimes that's unintentional and sometimes it's quite deliberate. So you have a lot of people's stories who are not recorded and not told within the historic record. And that's one of the reasons that I find uh, personal and community archiving so important um, and why, um, why we should invest our time in it. Because it is a lot of time. It's a lot of time and a lot of work to put your family papers together, to put your community papers together. Um, but it's important because you then have control over your own story you can decide how the history of your family gets uh, recorded in the historic record. Um, what, what gets told and, and how it gets told. Because if you're not telling your story, who will, right? It might be no one so that those stories never get told. Or it might be somebody who doesn't have the same level of knowledge as you do and therefore maybe might not get it right. So it's very important for you to take control of your own, your own historic narrative for your families and your communities. Um, and so that, that, is, that is really why I like to, um, to give these presentations and because I feel like what I'm doing is giving you the tools and the techniques that you need to make the decisions that you want to make. Okay. And this presentation in general is about archiving and metadata because I really like to think of these as a continuum. You know, a lot of times we'll take each one separately and we'll do maybe the physical processing separate from the digitizing, separate from the metadata creation. Um, but really it's all part of a greater continuum. And the way that you physically archive your materials, the way that you physically arrange them is going to have uh, an impact on the metadata and how you create your metadata and what your metadata contains. So we're going to talk about all of this. I'm going to start out talking just about the physical processing and then we'll move into digital materials and metadata toward the end. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, that sort of introduction to archiving, sort of the basics of what you can do, and then we're gonna um, take it into metadata. I really think of all of this as a continuum rather than like little discrete um, jobs that you're doing along the way. It's all interconnected, and the decisions that you make when you are arranging and preserving your materials will have um, an impact on the metadata that you create later. So let's go ahead and look at what we're going to be covering today. So I will talk about the basics of archiving, about creating your collection priorities, preservation, arrangement, digitization, and then we're going to move into a discussion of the metadata. So what exactly is met metadata? Who, who has the power to choose what information you record? Uh, what are the types of metadata? How do you go about actually recording that metadata. And then I'm going to show you some samples of metadata that um, might get your uh, gray cells going um, and, and help you see how yours could be arranged as well. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in with archiving, just the basics of archiving, of what you do when you have these great materials. So here's a hard truth about archiving. Not everything can or should be saved. 
right? We don't have, no institution in the world has all of the resources, all of the time to save everything that's out there, right? Um, we simply can't do it. And so archivists from the beginning have curated collections. They have decided what gets saved and what doesn't. That comes with a lot of implicit biases, right? And it comes with a lot of um, all kinds of baggage. Um, but somebody has to make those decisions. And so that decision can be yours to make when you're talking about your own materials. Um, and so what you need to do is create collection priorities, okay? What is, you need to consider the value of the materials that you meet, that you have. And when I say value, I don't necessarily mean um, uh, monetary value. Although it could, some of the things you have could be worth a lot of money. But when we talk about value, we're really talking about the intrinsic value of an item. And there are a lot of different kinds of value depending on what kind of material you're looking at. There is administrative value, there is fiscal value, um, there is operating value if you are recording um, something that has to do with an organization or a business. These are the two types of values that I've pulled out here that really have a lot of meaning when it comes to a community collection. The first is obvious, it's archival value. This is the value that most of us think about when we think about what is the value of the materials that we have. Right, so you have materials that could be of historical importance to your community or your organization, because of course you could be also archiving materials for civic organizations in your community, right? Um, so you're not just talking about family materials. Um, there's also evidential value, and that is, is material that documents your organization, who you are and what you do, what that civic organization is, what that civic organization stands for, uh, the ladies auxiliary or the PTA, right, who they are and what they do within that community. And then there's informational value, and the informational value is really just documenting the persons and the things and the events within your uh, community or your organization or your institution, right? So archival value is really at the top of the, uh, sort of the top of the pyramid uh, of values. Um, the other one that I want you to consider is legal value. So documents that you have or that, that, you know, family members have or community members have, they may have a legal value, something that's either required by government regulations. Um, I have a, a colleague who um, has a, uh, an organization um, to supply water to her neighborhood. There's a lot of legal stuff that goes on there that she has to keep track of. So there's, a, there's government regulations, but there's also, um, the legal value to protect your rights, okay? And this particularly, not only in this area, but in, in other parts of the country, this can be really important, especially if you're talking about property rights. So deeds and things like that. So, so keep in mind what is the value of what you have and um, what is its importance in your collection, okay? And that helps you decide what to keep and what not to keep if you have a limited amount of time, space, whatever. So a lot of this starts and ends with preservation. Uh, this is the definition of preservation from um, one of the American Library Association's textbooks, Preservation and Conservation for Libraries and Archives. It defines preservation as encompasses all the steps and activities needed to ensure that the holdings of a library or archive, now this is talking about formal libraries and archives, but there is nothing to say that this is not just as applicable to your family archives, okay? So every, all the activities that you do to make sure that those materials remain in the best possible condition for as long as possible, right? Whether that's 20 years or 200 years. Um, so let's talk about how to preserve these materials that you have that are of, of such importance uh, to you and your community. The number one thing you can do, if you can't do anything else, because sometimes preservation can get expensive, it really can. If you can't do anything else, the single most impactful thing you can do is put your materials in a stable environment, okay? Um, and that includes location, temperature and relative humidity, and maintenance. So let's take a look at each of those in detail, okay? 
first thing, location, 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 right? Um, I used to have a, um, a boss. He was actually, he actually trained me in my first years as an archivist. And he used to tell people, if you don't want to live there, don't put your records there. Okay, so don't put them in an attic or a basement or a garage, someplace where there are wild fluctuations in temperature and, and maybe bugs are getting in and out. So none of those places. You want your storage area to be dry, cool, and relatively dark because we all know that UV light can damage materials, right? Um, so keep them away from the light as much as you can. Keep them away from plumbing, heat sources, windows, outer walls, because we all know there's more fluctuation of temperature if something is against an outer wall. I mean, if you have something <clears throat> and there's a pipe in the wall behind your bookcase and that pipe breaks, you've got a problem. And I've had that problem before. You also want your materials to be four to six inches up above the ground, even if you just have like a little wooden pallet that you keep them on. That way that gives you just enough clearance. If you do have that pipe burst, that the water's gonna go under your materials instead of hit them. And then this one's a hard one actually, keep your pets out of the room <laughs> because they will track in all kinds of dirt and bugs and everything else. It's very hard to keep my cat out if he wants to get into a place, but you gotta do, <laughs> you gotta to make the effort to do it, okay? Next is relative temperature, is temperature and relative humidity. So you want your temperature to be between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity to be between 40 and 55 degrees. That's because you have to have some amount of moisture in your uh, materials because that allows them to remain flexible so that they don't become brittle and break as paper can often do. Uh, but you also don't want them to be too wet because then you have possible mold growth and, and deterioration and all kinds of stuff. But really the key is stability because ma massive fluctuations in temperature is actually far worse for an item than to have it just at a stable temperature that's slightly higher. This, this particular photo here is the um, uh, temp and humidity gauge that I used to use at a, at a library that I worked at previously. You can see that the temperature is 71.8 degrees, which is above that target range, right? But this was the temperature at which the, um, the physical um, plant folks could keep it steady. So this was a temperature they could keep it steady at without massive fluctuations. And so that was a compromise, right? So that, so that we don't have those fluctuations in temperature, we will have a slightly higher temperature. Um, so these are just guidelines. Do the best you can with what you have. And then finally, this is the one we all hate. You gotta maintain it. You have to go in there, you have to dust the boxes off, you have to vacuum, um, but just remember to um, keep liquid cleaners away from your materials because you don't want to spill them and have an accident and now you've got a liquid chemical all over your, your documents, okay? So this is the, if you can't do anything else, at least um, try to put your things in a stable place. So this is like when, when Shane talks about the shoe box, which I've got shoe boxes. I'm, you know, and I, I'm a professional and I still have shoe boxes with stuff, but make sure that those shoe boxes, you know, take it out from, you know, the attic um, and put it someplace that's a little more stable. So let's now go into what to do with the materials, how to arrange them. Because again, if you have that shoe box, or sometimes it's just um, just a cardboard box full of stuff. It's much easier. You, you want to know what you have and you want to be able to plan out and use your time to the best effectiveness. So you want to know what you have. That can help you down the road when it comes time to decide what you're going to digitize and how you're going to digitize it, right? So you want to consider basic arrangement of the materials. So from an organizational standpoint, if possible, maintain the original order of materials, right? So if you inherited all of your grandfather's papers from say his legal office, he probably had those in some kind of order that he used when he ran his business. If those are in an order already, leave them like that. Because that tells you, because the person who created those documents, who created those records, this was how they chose to organize them, right? And so that in, its, in and of itself tells you something about how the business was run. 
Okay, so if it's in an order already, leave it that way. If it's not, if it's just all willy-nilly in your shoebox, then you can impose your own scheme on the materials. You can separate them out however you choose to separate them. So you can arrange your materials by date. You can put, I'm, I've known people who put everything in date order and that was, that worked for them. Some people like to um, clump them by subject matter, right? Like here are all of my Christmas photographs. You know, for Christmas is all my life, here they all are. Um, some people like to clump them together by material type, right? So here are all of, all of my letters. Here are all the letters my grandfather wrote to my grandmother. You know, all the letters are together. All of the property deeds are together. Um, or you can do a combination thereof. So maybe I have all of the letters that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother. They're all together. But then within that, then I'm going to put them in order by date. So see, it's kind of nesting. Your arrangement can really be nested. Um, and then finally, however you do choose to organize your material, you'll want to write it down. <laughs> that seems kind of that seems kind of obvious, but in archives, in institutional archives, we call this a finding aid. And if you've ever used, if you've ever come in and used one of the archival collections and you've used a finding aid, it basically will give you a history of the organization or the person, and then it gives you a list of the materials and how they are arranged. Box one has all the correspondence in it. Box two has all the photographs in it. Box three has scrapbooks. And that way you know exactly what you have and you know where it is. And that's gonna be a big one when it comes time to move forward in your projects so that you can easily locate what you're looking for. Now, physical considerations when you are going through your materials. First of all, don't use staple, staples or paper clips. Uh, unless I do use stainless steel paper clips because they won't rust, but I do put a piece of buffer um, paper between the, the um, documents and the stainless steel paper clip if you have to do it. Um, you also want to remove any, um, anything that's already in the page that's not uh, stainless steel. This photograph, I actually keep a little jar on my desk full of all the little rusty bits and pieces that I have pulled out of archives um, in the past. I also always, always, always have an up-to-date tetanus shot uh, <laughs> because of things like this. This actually is a very rusty pen that I pulled out of um, a stack of papers. This was holding together a stack of papers. I like to use this photograph too because it reminds me, this one um, is, is one that you wouldn't think of. This is my favorite shade of nail polish, which they don't make anymore, which is a nice dark green. You want to be very careful if you have your um, nails painted because nail polish can leave a mark on pages like crayon. And now you, now you have a stray bright green mark on your page that you somehow need to clean off. So just be careful. And that's one of those things that you have to learn by experience. They don't teach you that in library school. Um, so hat tip for, for me for um, finding that one out for you. Okay, so don't use rubber bands or adhesive tape, right? We've all, we've all pulled out a, uh, you know, a document or a rolled poster and the rubber band is like all gnarly and it's adhered to the paint. It's terrible. Just don't use them. Take them off if you can, but only if it comes off without damaging the item. Don't mark on your documents with a pen. Sometimes you will need to make marks on documents in order to document their original order or something like that. If you do, make sure that you use a pencil and do so very lightly. The, the sort of one of the, the hallmarks of archiving is you don't want to do anything you can't reverse. Okay, it's all about doing things that are reversible. And finally, don't use sticky notes. If I could get rid of one thing in this world, I would get rid of sticky notes because even if you only have it on there for a few minutes, uh, it is going to leave behind a residue. It can stain your page, it can make your page sticky, and also that adhesive is very, very tempting to insects. So it will attract insects to eat your pages. So please do not use sticky notes uh, when you are uh, organizing your materials. 
So let's talk about what to do, like physically how to do, how to arrange these, what to do with them. So first of all is loose materials. And by loose materials, I mean letters, uh, deeds, any kind of documents, right? Um, you want to store these unfolded. So unfolded and flat in acid-free folders. If something is really brittle, like if it's gotten dry and it's just, it doesn't want to open up, don't force it. You may have to talk to a professional at that point. If you force it, you could end up breaking it and losing data off of it. Um, you can put mul multiple sheets in, in one folder. I used to have, I used to talk to somebody who, who was actually just putting page, one page per folder. Waste of your resources, don't do that. Um, use spacers to make sure that stuff isn't um, flopping around in there. This is a big one if you are documenting your community. You want to photocopy newspaper clippings because newspaper clippings are made with very, very cheap disposable paper and you all have seen that sort of crumbly newspaper. Um, there's no way to really to fix that. Your best bet is to make a high quality photocopy and then keep the photocopy separate from the original, okay? Label your photo, uh, label your folders, whatever folders you have, make sure you label them, right? This is all about being able to find these materials later. Um, use a pencil. If you have anything oversized, which is basically anything bigger than a legal size document, you'll want, you can roll it, um, but you have to roll it over like a piece of paper or a, a piece of card stock. It gives it a little bit more um, stability, okay? So other things that you might have, you might have pamphlets and brochures, like if you are documenting a civic organization, you might have um, brochures from events that, that occurred. Um, you'll want to just store those the same that you do in your, is your, your loose papers, just put them in folders and boxes, remove any staples like we talked about. Um, and then this is another one about keeping, you know, uh, not everything can and should be saved. You know, if you've got brochures from a, a, um, an event in your community and you have 30 of them that didn't get handed out, you don't need to keep 30 documents, right, of the same exact thing. You can keep two to three copies and then discard the rest. I usually call it keeping an air in a spare. I keep an air in a spare, you know, in my collection. So, uh, and then this is another big one is scrapbooks. What to do with your scrapbooks. Store them flat in boxes. So there's a, there's a temptation to put a scrapbook on a bookshelf like a regular book. And you really shouldn't do that because stuff can fall out of them. The binding is not always um, really secure. So put them in boxes. You can put acid-free pages between them if you want to. You can reattach uh, pieces that fall out if you do so in a very um, thoughtful manner. Remember, this is all about don't do anything you can't reverse, okay? Visual materials, this is the big one, right? This is the one that, that most of us are interested in is photographs. Um, so photographs, you can, there are lots of ways to store your photographs. You just wanna make sure you are not using PVC plastic, okay? So usually if something is a good plastic, it will say it is PAT compliant or it passes the PAT, which is the photo activity test. You also never, ever, ever wanna use those crazy magnetic pages. We call them magnetic pages. That's really adhesive, right? And remember, you don't want to put any adhesive on your materials. If you have negatives, store them separately from your photographs. Um, and the same with slides. There are special sleeves that you can buy that specifically fit slides and negatives. Okay. So now let's get, now we're getting into the juicy stuff, right? Now that you have some kind of organization for your materials, you know what you have, now you can start digitizing. And um, th this is the exciting part, right? Because this is where you start making those materials available to other people. You can share them online. Digitization, one of the best parts of digitization is that it really can ensure it, it goes right back into that preservation item, right? Because you're, you're helping to ensure the long-term preservation of these materials by creating these surrogates. So um, you don't have to keep taking that photo out every single time you want to, to see it. Every time you take it out, there's a, there's a chance that you will rip it or drop it or spill something on it. If you have this digital surrogate, you can look at it much more often, you can share it, um, and um, 
And it's just better. Now, that, that doesn't mean you want to get rid of that original, right? You want to still keep that original. But that surrogate allows you a lot more opportunities for access and sharing. Here are the scanning recommendations for items. And I know Shane has gone over this many times with you before about the kind of, um, the kind of files that you need to be creating and the, um, the levels at which you need to be scanning them. Um, right, you need a preservation copy and a use copy. Your preservation copy is gonna be a high, um, high resolution TIFF. Your use and share copy is going to be a lower resolution JPEG. The, the difference there is file size, right? You need to make sure whatever you're doing, this is all part of that planning process because you need to make sure that you have enough storage space to house these uh, digital documents when you create them, right? So that, for example, this image is from our Beisman Platt collection. Uh, this Platt, I think is about, it's about eight by 12 in real life, something to that effect. Um, this, the preservation master, the TIFF file for this digital image is 201 megabytes. The use copy in JPEG is two megabytes. Huge difference, but I need to be able to store both of those files. So just keep that in mind when you get to the digitization phase of your project. And as I said earlier, don't discard your original. There have been a lot, because we never know what kind of, of technology is going to come down the line in the future, but also things can happen to your digital copy as well. So you never want to throw out your original. The National Archives had a problem with that with one of their censuses. There's a census that they, that they um, digitized on, on media that was, that was prevalent in the 60s tossed out the originals, and now we are so far advanced now in our technology, it's ridiculous. But those originals are gone. So the same things that you considered when you had your physical items, you need to consider those also with your digital items. Arrangement, preservation. You still need to think about those in a digital landscape as well. So this includes both the materials that you digitize, right, the things you take from an analog state to a digital state, but also born digital materials, right? Because the correspondence, those letters that you used to have from your grandfather to your grandmother, what is that now? It's email, right? So the documents that you're creating now are going to be the archives of the future. So you also need to think about born digital materials, born digital photographs, okay? Um, so these kind of um, structures will help with both those digitized and the born digital materials. And you can refer back to your established collection priorities, right? We already talked about setting those collection priorities for your physical materials. Once you have digital materials, you should be thinking along the same lines. Um, I tend to take, and I always have, uh, I will take six photos to get one good one sometimes even more. Do I need to keep every single photo that I took or do I only need to keep the good one, you know, the one that came out right? And that is, that is just as applicable for your physical photographs as it is for your digital photographs, okay? So keep those collection priorities in mind and what you are and are not going to keep. When it comes to the arrangement of your digital files, one of the big things you need to think about is your file name right? The name that you give to that digital file once you have scanned an item, okay? It needs to be descriptive so that you can find it and maybe even a third party can find it. And you need to have a naming convention that you use consistently so that you can find those things later. And um, you'll want to avoid using character, uh, special characters like ampersands or spaces. Spaces can mess up um, the presentation of, an, of a document if, if a website or a piece of software can't read it properly. If you've ever opened up a PDF online and like the, the file name has all of these weird ampersands and all these weird symbols in it, it's because there were either special um, characters or there were spaces in there and it couldn't read it. Okay, so here's an example. Here's both a good and example, good and bad example of a good file name. So a good file name would be Southwest Wind, which is the name of our yearbook at the university. 
So it's telling me that this image came, it tells me exactly where the image came from. It came from the southwest wind. It tells me the subject of that particular photo, which is Hermit's Peak, and then it tells me the year. So given that information, I can then find, I can find that original item that this scan was taken from, okay? And then if I use that same naming convention, then I can find all the things from the Southwest Wind of 1961. See what I'm saying? Um, a bad example of a file name is the, the, just a bunch of letters and numbers. I mean, you all know if you've taken a digital photo or if you've scanned something, the default of those uh, machines is usually going to be a random set of letters and numbers. You don't want that because you don't want to have to sit for hours on end scrolling through your photographs trying to figure out which one has the image that you're looking for. Okay. To follow on with that, once you have those files and those descriptive names, then you want to clump them together in folders, grouped logically, and give those folders descriptive names. So in my previous example, when I was looking at Southwest Wind, Hermit's Peak 1961, I would probably put all of my images from the Southwest Wind of 1961 in one folder right because they all came from the same place they all came from the the um, same source um, and again give them good descriptive titles for example a good folder name would be nmhu homecoming 1961. a bad name would be project number 12. maybe i know which project was my 12th project of the year but somebody else is not going to Okay, so you'll want to make sure that you are descriptive and consistent in your naming. And you'll, this all follows with the collection plan that you made, right? However you arranged those physical materials, you can mirror that in your digital materials. And then that way you know exactly what you're looking at and exactly where it came from. Okay, and you can nest them just like we nested, we talked about nesting the, um, the physical materials, right? Um, so all the folders from a particular year are together or all the folders from a particular topic are together. Um, and you can do it however you choose to do it as long as you are consistent, right? You can do everything by year and then subfoldered within the year by the event. So here are all my fo photographs from 1961 and within those are the homecoming photos. Or you can do it the other way. Here are all of my homecoming photos and then within that, they're all separated by year. That is completely up to you as long as you are consistent with the way that you do it, okay? So now let's talk about the preservation angle of digital materials. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times we think, well, I digitized it. That's, it's good. I'm good for years and years and years. I don't have to worry about, oh, oh. <laughs> I see that kitty. <laughs> It's the Zoom photo bomb of the, of the pet at home. Um, it's the best part of Zoom, quite frankly. Um, so digital materials are actually, in some ways, much more difficult to uh, preserve long-term than paper materials are, right? Because digital files break down over time and lose image data. So um, if you, this, this actually happened to the Getty a few years back, they took digital photographs of all of their tapestries and then they just put them on a server. They're like, well, this is just our, you know, this is our preservation photo. We're just going to stick it on a server. And they didn't go back to it until five years later. And when they did, they found that just over time, some of those files had been corrupted and they couldn't even access them anymore just from sitting on the server. So it can happen to your um, to your file itself. In addition, the actual media that it's on can fail, and I promise you it will. If you have never lost a jump drive to inherent failure, um, take it from me. It is, it is bad. Um, <laughs> that's why you always want to back up your data. Um, and then the hardware and software can become obsolete itself. I have a thesis that I wrote for my undergraduate degree in 1998 
I can no longer read it because I don't, it's on a floppy disk. I don't even own uh, a computer anymore that has a floppy disk on it. And I wrote it using um, uh, Apple specific software that is completely out of date. You can't even get that software anymore unless you're like a, a computer um, history collector. So I can't access that through both a hardware and software failure. And that was only 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. So these things can, can age out a lot more quickly than you think they will. So here is what you can do once you, because doing all of this, doing your digitization, doing your metadata, that's a lot of time and work and you don't want to lose that. So here are some of the things that you can do to ensure that those materials last as long as possible. Back up your files. Back, 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 back up your files. <laughs> um, I cannot stress this enough. And I will tell you from personal experience, I am a professional archivist and I have lost files because I thought to myself, oh, I'll back it up later. I'll back it up later. And I lost them. Um, it happens to us all. Um, so just remember to back up your files on a regular basis. The National Archives recommends that you save your data on at least three different media storage types in at least three different places okay so that means burn it to a disk save it to an external hard drive and back it up to the cloud right those three are readily available to you you can also use a thumb drive or a jump drive or a usb drive um, but just know that those fail pretty quickly um, You'll also, and it helps that there's this cloud storage now, but you want to, when you have that media, keep them in separate locations, okay? I, ha I, I went to a conference once and, I, and we were talking about preservation like this, and a man from, um, I think he was from the Smithsonian, was telling us that he had been incredibly, incredibly um, um, on top of things about backing up. He always backed up his computer's hard drive to an external hard drive, always backed it up. And he, but here's the problem. He kept his external hard drive sitting right next to his computer. They had a leak, his computer got wet and caught on fire and melted his external hard drive. So he lost both the copy that was on his computer's hard drive and he lost the copy that was on his external hard drive because it was sitting right next to his computer. So even if you put them on separate parts of the room, if something catastrophic happens, if you have a leak or a fire, maybe one of those two will be saved. Okay, and it is a lot easier now that we have the cloud because then you're search, you're actually storing it on a server, you know, in the middle of Kansas somewhere. Because that's the thing about cloud storage. I mean, we all know this, right? Cloud storage is not really in the cloud. Cloud storage just means that it's somewhere off of your, um, your immediate physical location. Um, places that offer cloud storage, it's still stored on a physical server, it's just somewhere else on a server farm, okay? Um, you'll also wanna just spot check your, your files, you know, on an annual basis, just randomly open up some files and see how they look and if they're still accessible. Um, and you'll want to refresh your storage media every three to five years. All of this is really complicated because now you're starting to get into a lot of financial issues as well because you have to keep rebuying your storage media, right? You have to buy a new external hard drive and port all of your old stuff over there to make sure that your old one doesn't fail. Okay, and this is a great link that I've put here um, from the Library of Congress on personal archiving. It's a, it's a nice little brochure and I'm going to share this with Shane so that he can share it with all of you. Okay. Now we're getting to it, right? So now, now that you've gotten to the, the digitization phase, now we're, we want to talk about the metadata, right? Because a digital file without metadata is... I won't say it's useless, but it's very hard to figure out what you, you have and get to what you need, okay? So we're gonna talk about what is metadata, how to choose the information that you record, and who chooses that, the types of metadata, how to record it, and then look at some samples, okay? So first of all, what is metadata? And here is a very formal definition from the Society of American Archivists. Characterization or description documenting the identification, management, nature, use, or location of information resources, which is data. 
So a lot of us, um, especially if we grew up in the computer age, we think of data as, you know, bits and bytes and zeros and ones and files. But data is really any resource. A photograph is data, right? A, a, a physical photograph is data. So what metadata is, a lot of people consider it data about data. Okay, so if the photograph itself is data, any information on the backside is metadata. So if your grandmother flipped that photograph over and wrote down everybody that's in the photograph and the year and where it was, she was creating metadata. Okay, that is data about data. Um, and it's, it, can, it refers to any kind of resource, right? So photographs, documents, audio recordings, video recordings, any of that can be further described with metadata and should be further described with metadata. So it can include, metadata can include descriptive information, structural information, technical information, preservation information, administrative information, and I'm gonna like to break this all down for you in just a sec, so don't be like, whoa, ah, what was that? Um, so we're gonna go into all of that in just a second, okay? So the first thing to, to think about is who gets to choose? right? Who decides what type of information you capture about an item? Because some of it's obvious, some of it's not. Who makes that decision? It's usually one of two, that decision usually comes from one of two places. First of all, if you are like me and you work for an institution, or if you are part of a greater organization or a group like this group that has a specific project or a specific website, that organization or group may have a standardized template for all of its partners. They may, they may tell you what items to capture. Um, and that, you know, I, at my previous, where I came from uh, to hear from South Carolina, and I was part of a digital library initiative there, and the people who administered that sent us all templates. They were like, here's the template, here is the exact information you need to capture about these items. So sometimes that will come from an outside entity if you are a part of that kind of group. That kind of group may require you to use a formalized metadata schema. Um, that's that, If you've ever heard of Dublin Core, that's what Dublin Core is. It is a formalized metadata scheme um, it's called core because it has core elements um, and Dublin is just because they they wrote it in Dublin, Ohio. It's, it's a much it's a much more uh, mundane um, uh, reason than how it sounds. Dublin core sounds very cool, but um, so the Dublin core tells you what 15 items you need to capture about an item. Okay, that's if you're using Dublin core. It's very formalized. Um, the organization that you're working with may also require you to use controlled vocabulary. Um, Library of Congress subject headings is an example of controlled vocabulary. It's one that's used the most frequently. Controlled vocabulary just means that there is a specific term that maps to a specific idea or place or person. It's a way of ensuring that everybody is using the same term for the same item. And that can be super helpful for finding things, right? Because if we are all using the Library of Congress term airship, I can go in and search for airship and find everything that I want to on that topic. But what if some people are using blimp or some people are using dirigible? All of those things are the same, a blimp and a dirigible and an airship. Those are, those are interchangeable terms, right? The Library of Congress subject heading for that is airship. So um, if I am not using those controlled vocabularies, then I have to search multiple times using multiple different terms, and it can be much more time consuming. The downside of using controlled vocabularies is that they are, I will say limiting at best, offensive at worst. Um, they are terms, they again, um, just as Shane was talking about earlier, they are terms that were created by the government. They are terms that have often a very colonial or settler mindset, um, and they don't take um, community into account. And they don't take, they're, they're very rigid in, um, in their descriptive terms. And it could be downright offensive to some people. 
Um, so it's, it's, there are definitely downsides to using the Library of Congress subject headings. If you are not part of something formal or if your group is giving you more um, latitude in what you can do, then you can create your own metadata scheme. Um, depending on what is important to you and what is useful to you. So you have, if you're doing it yourself, if you're choosing your metadata scheme yourself, you have more flexibility to describe resources in an accurate and appropriate fashion. Um, something that gets around those, those strictures of LCSH, those limitations of LCSH. Um, for example, the term Matanza is not a Library of Congress subject heading. So if I, you know, took photographs of the Matanza that we had at Highlands my first year here and I wanted to create metadata about those photographs and I was using LCSH, I would have to come up with some other subject heading. I would probably have to use events or festivities or it just depends. But Matanza is not an actual subject heading. Um, so you have, if you're doing it yourself, you have more flexibility though to, to include those kind of terms in your metadata. And you can, there, the, the ways that we get around this in an institutional setting is really to use something like that in the description, which is therefore still searchable, but it's not the official subject term, in case you're wondering how we get around that kind of thing. Um, if you're, in, if you're creating your metadata schema yourself, you can include as much or as little information as you want, depending on what you need. What, how are you going to be using this metadata? And what are your needs? How, how do you want it to be accessed? Is it something that only you are going to use or are you hoping other people will use it? Those are the things you need to keep in mind. Whatever you do, whatever you choose, remember to be consistent. And I know I've said that like five times already. Um, a lot of these choices, you have a lot of choices that you can make and a lot of personal power in how you um, archive your materials as long as you're consistent in it, because that's gonna help you in the long run. Um, and anybody that you might wanna donate your materials to um, down the line. Okay, so let's look at the types of metadata. There's a lot on this slide, right? So I don't want you to get um, intimidated by this because you don't have to put every single thing in your metadata. Um, some institutions will have different types of metadata. Some organizations will have different types of metadata. You don't have to have every single bit in, in your metadata, okay? But I want you to understand the kind of things that you can capture if you choose to. The first one is descriptive metadata. And let's be honest, this is the one that the majority of us use. It's the one that is going to help give us the best access to our stuff. Because descriptive metadata is describing the form and the content of that material. So if you're looking at a photograph, it's who is in this photograph? Where was it taken? What was the date? What are some of those subjects and keywords that um, will help somebody find this photograph or will give somebody access to this photograph. And also, this is a big one, especially if you're doing handwritten documents, a transcription. Uh, because when you scan items that are handwritten, there is no way to um, make that searchable. Um, optical character recognition is um, software that can help make TypeScript stuff searchable, right? That's why our PDFs are searchable because we can OCR them. There is no, uh, they have not yet perfected OCR for handwriting because there's so much variation in handwriting. So if you want somebody to be able to search or if you want to be able to search um, the content of that letter, the content of it, then you're going to have to transcribe it. Okay, so that's also descriptive metadata. And as I said, this is the most common type of metadata. And it's the kind that, that, most, um, that is most useful for most researchers. Because this is how you're going to find, well, I just need photographs of, um, you know, of Mora from 1960. You know, so that's, that's that kind of descriptive metadata that people are going to be searching for. Other types of metadata, though, are helpful. There's technical meta metadata, and this is going to include any information about the file itself. So technical metadata is mostly for, for digital stuff, obviously. 
Um, but also if there's any software or hardware that's needed to access that file. Just like I was talking about earlier with my, my poor thesis that's sitting on a, um, um, what is essentially now a, um, it's a, it's a coffee table thing now. I just put my drinks on it now. Um, coaster. <laughs> that's a coaster. It's a, it's a very nice coaster. Um, but if I knew what kind of hardware and software I needed to open that file, I would want to put that in my technical metadata. Okay, and that's really if you have something that is in a proprietary file. Um, there is also structural metadata. Structural metadata tells you the relationships between various discrete images or pieces of information. Um, you, I often see discrete metadata if somebody digitizes a pamphlet or a book, right? So technical metadata is telling me this particular image is page one of this pamphlet or a page two of this pamphlet or page three. It, it gives you that structural relationship to the larger item, which is the pamphlet itself, okay? And then finally, this is one, the, the last one, administrative metadata is one, this is probably my number two for, for um, including in your metadata because administrative metadata um, will record the provenance. So who created this item? because that can tell you a lot about it, right? It's not just you, you're not the creator. You may have digitized it, but you didn't necessarily create it, unless you did. It tells you who created it and who has had it over the years, who owns it, you know? That's the provenance of an item. The administrative uh, metadata will also include rights and permissions. Who has the copyright to this item? Do you have the copyright to this item or does the creator have the copyright to this item? or is it in the public domain? Meaning anyone can use it, which is where you're getting into permissions. If it is copyrighted, who can you contact for permission to use it? Okay, um, and that comes in that as soon as you start putting stuff online, people are gonna wanna use it. Okay, they're gonna wanna put it in their book or any other number of thing. Okay, and so you want to be sure that you think about that, about who's going to be using it and who you want to allow to use it. Um, this administrative metadata is sometimes also called preservation metadata because it also does record that. It records any, um, any preservation materials you have taken or any preservation um, actions that you have taken on these materials, which includes reformatting. Remember I said that digitization is really a part of long-term preservation, right? Because you're reformatting that into a different surrogate um, uh, item. And so you will want to record that in your metadata that you took that step. So now that you know what pieces there are, how do you put those together, right? What do you do to actually physically put that together into a document? Um, as I said earlier, sometimes formalized projects will have a template, right? They might send you a spreadsheet that already has all the fields that you need to fill out. And that's awesome. Uh, but again, a bit more restrictive. Um, if you want to create your own metadata, you are you can really choose any kind of software you want that works well for you. I know people who have used um, Google Docs to create their metadata, Microsoft Tables, um, Access, any number of things that allow you to um, to organize that data in the way that you want to. Now, many many people use Microsoft Excel. Okay, it's the it's what I use for my personal metadata and it's what I use at my institution as well. That's because it's ubiquitous. You know, just about everybody has access to Microsoft Excel and you can also it's also easily compatible and convertible like you can you can convert an Excel spreadsheet into XML. You can convert it into CSV, which is a um, comma separated values. You can, you know, you can convert it into um, plain text. So you have, once you put it into Excel, you have some convertibility there um, if you want to share it with other people. Uh, whatever style you choose, again, maintain your consistency. Okay, so be consistent in the type of information that you record. Be consistent in the terminology that you use. 
and be consistent in your naming conventions. That's all going to make it so much easier for you down the road when you when you try to use the materials, because that's what all this is about, right? We want to be able to preserve it, but we want to use it too. We want to be able to share it with people and have them study it or whatever it is that they're going to use it for. So Obviously, many archivists create their metadata as part of the digitization project process, right? That's where it usually goes. You usually scan your document and then you fill in your metadata over here. Um, and, and so they're usually paired like that, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to work along those lines. If you can't get to a scanner right now because your scanner is locked up in Donnelly Library like mine is, um, if you can't get to your scanner, you can still work on your metadata from the materials. You know, if you have your photographs in front of you, remember, if you've already, um, if you've already put them in order, if you've already organized them, this is the order you're going to scan them in. So you can go ahead and start creating your metadata on them. You know, and then once you do get to the scanning phase, then you can fill in the scanning information, fill in, you know, the date that you digitized it and fill in the file name that you used. But your metadata creation does not have to be married to the actual digitization process, process right? You can be using that now. You can be filling that out now um, just from the materials that you have in front of you. So let's take a look at a couple of examples, right? What, what am I talking about? What, what does this look like in practice? So this is I have called this a sample institutional metadata for lack of a better term. Um, this is, so those images that I used earlier, a couple of images of Rogers, that image from the Beisman, this is a sample of how I might record that metadata for the Donnelly Library. And you can see I have a lot of fields here, right? I have the title of the actual item itself. I have the creator, if it's known, it's not always known, but if it is known, you need to put that in there. And then I have um, different subject fields, right? I have three subject fields because there are, because I am using the Library of Congress subject headings for the Donnelly Library. It's what we use. So there are different types of subject headings. There are topical subject headings, there are personal and corporate subject headings, and there are geographical subject headings. That's just through the LCSH. So you can see I have those written out. I have the date if it's known. ND means no date. I have a description, and the, sub the description is usually the most subjective part because that's where whoever's processing it is describing that item. And so it's gonna depend a lot on their own personal knowledge of that document or photograph. Then there's a transcription, if there is one. There's the language. This is very important to document, especially in an area like this where so many people are bilingual or even trilingual, right? So it's very important to um, record the language in which the item is um, written or spoken if you are doing an oral history, right? Um, the collection title, so this is the official title that it has within the institution, the format, the collection number, all of this is kind of technical information, right, about its, its institutional information, the media type, my digitization specifications, you can see that I record that, what DPI, what bit depth did I use, what equipment did I use, the date that I digitized it, remember that's preservation data, because that's the date that I reformatted it the file name so that I can then um, connect it to that file and the copyright status. It's a lot, right? And this is actually a shortened version. Um, some, some institutional projects have really, really intense metadata, right? Um, this is sort of a shortened version of that. But let me show you what my metadata looks like. This is an actual, I promise you, this is a real part of my personal metadata for my photo collection um, that I have at home, which is why all the file names begin in gray. I have different file names because my, the, my photos, the way that I have um, arranged my, my historic photographs, they're by family 
because I do my family genealogy. So I have them clustered by the various branches of my family and some of them my husband's family as well. And so my convention is that I give them a file name that, that um, uh, maps to that family branch that I am studying. I have a description of it. I have the date, any transcription from the photographs, and then any miscellaneous data. I, I record miscellaneous data as sort of a notes to myself, right? You can see some of these um, are actually postcard photographs. Um, and one of them says substrate cracked. That means that the, the substrate on which the photo is printed has cracked. And that's, an, that's a note to myself that there's a preservation issue there that I need to address. So you can see this is much simpler, right? Because this is my personal metadata and this fulfills my needs, what I need this to do, okay? Um, and so you can see you have choices to make. It does not have to be, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, 20, 25 fields. Um, it can be, especially if you want to share it with others but you have a lot of flexibility in what you do with your own materials, okay? I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here. I, I don't like being one of those architects that he sits here and tells you what you should do. I will give you good advice on best practices, but a lot of this is empowering you. It's giving you the power um, to, to decide what happens with your own materials and your own history. Okay, so I do have here at the end some really useful resources. Um, the Library of Congress has a really good section on digital preservation. Um, National Archives and Records Administration also does so. Um, if you've never heard of it, there is this organization called the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Fabulous, fabulous free resources on preservation issues. Anything you can imagine. What happens if I have mold? You can go there and look up what happens if you have mold. Um, really great resources. And again, I'm going to share all this with um, Shane so that you can have it as well. So that's it. I know I talked a lot, but I'm very excited about this topic. So that's what happens when you get me going. Um, so this is my contact information. That is me being very cute at three years old. This is from my own archives. Um, so please, I am here, you know, I'm, I'm here to help. It's what, it's what I do, it's what I love to do, um, and I am happy to answer any questions you might have.